بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله نحمده ونستعينه ونستغفره ونعوذ بالله من شرور انفسنا ومن سيئات اعمالنا ما يهده الله فلا مضل له ومن يضلل فلا هادي له واشهد ان لا اله الا الله وحده لا شريك له واشهد ان محمدا عبده ورسوله اما بعد فان احسن الكلام كلام الله وخير الهدى هدى محمد صلى الله عليه وسلم وان شر الامور محدثاتها وكل محدثه بدعه وكل بدعه ضلاله وكل ضلاله في النار today we start the second hadith second hadith which is the well known famous hadith the hadith of jibril and the sheikh has uh, titled this uh, chapter heading uh, the coming of jibril alayhi salam in order to teach the muslims the affair of their religion so the sheikh sheikh salih al sheikh he then first of all brings the text of the hadith so it is narrated on the authority of umar ibn al khattab radiyallahu anhu who said that whilst we were sitting with the messenger of allah sallallahu alaihi wasallam one day when a man appeared or a man came who had this intensely white thaw he was wearing an intensely white thaw and his hair was intensely black and there couldn't there, were, there weren't any signs of a journey as seen upon him and nor did any one of us know him and then he sat near the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam and so he put his knees to the knees he put his knees to the knees of the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam and he placed the palms of his hands upon his thighs and then he said o muhammad inform me akhbirni an al-islam inform me about islam and so he meaning the messenger sallallahu alaihi wasallam replied al islam an tashhadu tashhada an la ilaha illa allah wa anna muhammadan rasulullah wa tuqimu as-salah wa tu'ti az-zakah wa tasumu ramadan wa tahijju al-bayt in istata'ta ilayhi sabila so he said o muhammad inform me about islam so the messenger said islam is that you testify that none has the right to be worshiped except Allah and that Muhammad is the messenger of Allah and that you establish the prayer and that you give the zakah that you fast in Ramadan and that you perform the pilgrimage to the house if you are able to find a way to that and so then he meaning uh, the this man he said sadaqt you have spoken the truth and so Umar says that we were surprised that he should ask him the question and then tell him that he spoke truthfully then he said this man faqala akhbirni an al-iman inform me about iman so he meaning the messenger sallallahu alaihi wasallam replied and tu'mina billah wa malaikata wa malaikatihi wa kutubihi wa rasulihi wal yawm al-akhir wa tu'mina bil qadar khairihi wa sharrihi that you believe in allah and his angels and his books and his messengers and the last day and that you believe in al qadar both the good of it and the evil from it so then again he said sadaqt the man said sadaqt you you have spoken truthfully then he said so the man then said fa akhbirni an al ihsan inform me about ihsan what is ihsan so he meaning the messenger sallallahu alaihi wasallam replied an ta'bud allah كأنك تراه فإن لم تكن تراه فإنه يراك that you worship Allah as if you see him and even though you do not see him then he certainly sees you then he said inform me about the hour the final hour and so the messenger sallallahu alaihi wasallam replied the one being questioned is no more knowledgeable of it than the one asking the question And then he was, then he said the man said inform me about its signs so then inform me about its signs and so the messenger sallallahu alaihi wasallam said that the slave girl will give birth to her to her own mother 
and that you will see the barefooted, destitute, destitute Bedouins, you know, Bedouins, the, the herders of sheep, competing with each other in building lofty buildings. And then the, the man uh, went, you know, he departed, and then uh, the Messenger وسلم, said, O oh, Umar, do you know who, that, who the questioner was? And so I said, Allah and his Messenger know best. So he said, this was Jibreel who came to you in order to teach you your religion. <coughs> so this hadith was reported uh, in the Sahih of uh, Imam Muslim. And the Shaykh then begins his commentary, Shaykh Salih al-Shaykh, he begins his commentary of this hadith and he says, first of all, this hadith is a mighty hadith. Uh, such that some of the people of knowledge, some of the scholars, some of the people of knowledge, they have called, they have called this hadith Ummu Sunnah, Ummu Sunnah, the you know the the the, 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 the essence of the Sunnah or the, the mother of the Sunnah, and so they've called this hadith Ummu Sunnah, just like for example we have in the Quran the Ummu Al Quran, which is Surah Al Fatiha, the opening surah, which is so called because it basically it, you know in in essence it summarizes uh, the core. Uh, teachings of the of, of the Quran, and so this hadith is the hadith Umm Sunnah, the you know the the essence of the Sunnah because all of the Sunnah, in fact, all of the Sunnah returns back to this particular hadith, and in this hadith we find that in it is an explanation of aqidah, the affairs of creed, and we know that the creed itself is built upon the six pillars of Iman which this hadith contains, and likewise this hadith is an explanation of the Sharia. And this is because the hadith mentions the five pillars of Islam. And then likewise, the hadith mentions the unseen affairs, the affairs of the unseen. And some of its signs, like, you know, the final hour and some of its signs. And even before that, even before all of that, we find that in this hadith there is a mention of the, you know, manners, the adar, the way that a person ought to behave in, in, in mannerisms. And likewise in ibadah, and likewise in the, you know, in, in in the correction or the rectification of the heart, and directing that to Allah, and directing one's face to Allah, directed to Allah subhanahu wa taala, uh, and this is because of the mention of al ihsan, al ihsan. And likewise within it is the mention of the hour and its various signs, and of course these are some of the unseen affairs and some of the signs that point to the unseen affairs. So in other, in other words, these are some of the, the, the matters that this hadith contains. And so therefore we find that the, that the bulk of the sunnah, that the bulk of the sunnah in fact returns back to this hadith. Similar to what is found in the statement of Allah, the mighty and majestic, in a verse in the Quran in Surah Al-Nahl, the 16th surah, verse 90, verse 90, in which Allah says, إِنَّ اللَّهَ يَأْمُرُ بِالْعَدْلِ وَالْإِحْسَانِ وَإِتَاءِ ذِي الْقُرْبَى وَيَنْهَى عَنِ الْفَحْشَاءِ وَالْمُنْكَرِ وَالْبَغِي يَعِذُكُمْ لَأَلَّكُمْ تَذَكَّرُونَ Indeed, Allah commands you with justice and with benevolence and with giving uh, in charity to the, to, the, to, to the near relative and he prohibits from uh, al fahsha meaning shameful deeds and evil deeds, and al baghi meaning uh, oppression, and he admonishes you in order that you may remember. So, some of the salaf, some of the mufassirun, the explainers of the Quran from the salaf, they said that in this verse, all of the rulings of the religion enter, in, enter into it. All of the deen, all of the religion is actually contained in this verse. And so in a similar manner, the, all of the usul of the hadith, the, all of the like, core foundations and principles in the hadith, in the prophetic hadith, are found in this hadith. This hadith. And this hadith is known, otherwise known, it's, it's called the hadith of Jibreel. It's uh, known as the hadith of Jibreel. And all of this narration that you've, that you've heard from the beginning to the end is from the narration of Umar ibn al-Khattab, but it's also narrated by other companions, but in parts, right? in isolated parts. So, for example, um, and, and likewise with some kind of a, a summary, in, in a summarized form, in isolation, in other parts. And we, we find it, for example, from the hadith of Abu Huraira, 
radiallahu uh, anhu, we find well, the, you know, the same hadith uh, in, in, in the two sahihs, uh, narrated by Bukhari and Muslim, but in, in part, not in its complete uh, length. So therefore, this hadith, within it is a mention of al-Islam and al-Iman and al-Ihsan. So Islam in Islam, al-Iman, creed, uh, faith, sorry, faith, and al-Ihsan, benevolence. And this hadith indicates that all of these three are from the religion. Right? From the deen as a whole, there is Islam, and there is Iman, and there is Ihsan. And the proof of this is that at the end of the hadith, the Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, Atakum yu'allimukum deenakum. He came to you to teach you, teach you your deen. So therefore, he made, so therefore, in light of the hadith, Islam and Iman and Ihsan are all, all enter into the deen. Or the deen as a whole is comprised of Islam, Iman and Ihsan. And likewise, the, another thing is that the religion, which obviously is Islam, itself is divided into three levels, therefore. So we have Islam, Iman and Ihsan. And then the Sheikh mentions a, a principle here, uh, an important principle that he will mention in, in, in summary, which is that sometimes we find a general noun, and that general noun isn't necessarily... It, 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 the, the general noun will also have a part of it, a section of it, which is, which is also given the same name. Now, to obviously, to give an example, he says, Islam is the religion. Islam is the deen. We know that. And this deen is divided into Islam, Iman, and Ihsan. So therefore, when we speak of Islam as a whole or in general, we say that, the, that within, the, within this Islam as a whole, there is another Islam. Another Islam. There, there is Islam, from within this Islam. And the Shaykh says this is an important point to understand in general when we come to understand the Sharia, which is because sometimes we come across certain words, we, we come across certain words, and one of the forms and types of that word, what that word represents, <coughs> is the same word itself. Is the same word itself. So in this particular example, we find that when we speak of Islam as a whole, Islam as the religion as a whole, but we find that within it is something, a, a part of it which is also Islam, right? So in other words, sometimes we have general nouns, general words, and part of which is something which is also given the same name or the same word. Um, so, so therefore we say that, the Sheikh says, that Islam, the, the general Islam, which is the general noun, it consists of or, or it comprises of Islam, Iman and, and Ihsan. So therefore, Islam on its own in the general sense, it doesn't represent that specific meaning of Islam. The, 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 you know, the specific, uh, uh, you know, in its specific sense, when we find that it's mentioned along with Iman and Ihsan. Right? So for example, like here in this hadith, we find that Iman has been mentioned along with Iman, uh, Islam has been mentioned along with Iman and Ihsan. And so therefore, this, is, this Islam has like a specific meaning in this context, right? It's not the general overall Islam that we're speaking of because it's been mentioned alongside Iman and Ihsan. So therefore, Islam here must have a specific uh, meaning. And the Sheikh says that it's, this is important to understand because some of the people of knowledge, uh, because they didn't pay attention to this specific matter, then they basically said that Islam and Iman is just a single thing. It's the one and the same thing. And they didn't distinguish between Iman and Islam. And mistakenly, they even ascribed this statement or this viewpoint to the majority of the Salaf, that this was a view that the majority of the Salaf held, when this isn't when this isn't the case, this is not correct. Rather, the Salaf they differentiated between Iman and Islam. So therefore, when we find, so the way we understand it is, for example, when we find 
that Islam is mentioned in one place and Iman is mentioned in another place, right? So the Salaf would distinguish between that situation and between a situation where Islam and Iman are mentioned together in the same place. Right? So we must distinguish between these two situations because in these two situations, the meanings of Islam and Iman therefore will be different depending on how and where they are mentioned. So for example, when we find Islam is mentioned in one place and Iman is mentioned in another place, like for example, Islam is mentioned in one verse and Iman is, men Iman is mentioned in another verse, or Islam is mentioned in one hadith and Iman is mentioned in another hadith, then in this case, the way we understand it is that Islam represents the whole of the religion when it's mentioned alone. And likewise, Iman, when it's mentioned alone, it represents the whole of the religion likewise. So, what we find, however, is that in this hadith, Islam is in fact mentioned along with Iman and along with Ihsan. And so therefore, when we find it mentioned along with Iman, then, is, then what the Islam that is being spoken of is something specific. You know, it's, it's not the whole of the religion, it's a specific part of the religion. So Islam now has a specific meaning and not necessarily uh, and not the you know not the meaning which, which covers the whole of the, the religion. And likewise Iman, when Iman is mentioned along with Islam, then Iman carries a specific meaning and not the overall you know uh, the, the religion as, as a whole. Right? So we need to under, understand this and this will become clearer in what is uh, yet to follow inshallah. And then in the hadith it continued, uh, the, 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 um, uh, Umar ibn al-Khattab mentioned when all of a sudden a man appeared with you know, intensely white clothes and intensely black hair. And the Shaykh says that this description here by Umar ibn al-Khattab, the manner in which it's mentioned, is in fact a praise of this characteristic. Now, this is a praise. A praise meaning a praise of intensely, uh, an intensely white thobe, pure white thobe, and deeply black hair. It's a praise of this characteristic. However, the Sheikh says that one of these characteristics is something that can be, that, that a person can acquire, and the other person, the, the other characteristic is something that's merely, um, it's something, that, 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 you know, it's something that's natural. It can't be acquired. So for, so for example, the, the pure black hair, the intensely black hair that this man had, this is something that is, a, you know, it, it's part of a, a person. It's something um, inherent in a person, a part of his uh, makeup and his body and his makeup. It's not, it's not something that a person can just go out and acquire. You know, like, unlike, for example, a thobe. Unlike the thobe, then with a thobe, it's something that any person can go and get like a, a white thobe. It's, it's clean, it's pure, it's intensely white, it's bright white, and they can wear the thobe, right? The first, the, the characteristic of the hair is something that can't be, you know, it can't be something that a person can just acquire. Um, and for this reason, the Sheikh says that it's, it's not permissible for a person to dye his hair black when he doesn't already have, you know, black hair. It's something that is prohibited in uh, the Sharia. And as for the thobe, the intensely white thobe, then again, the, the context in which this statement is made by Umar ibn al-Khattab, it, it necessitates that this is a praise of, of anyone who wears like an intensely pure white uh, thobe, anyone who is uh, described in this manner. And that's why the Prophet وسلم, he used to like, he used to love the white thobe and he used to wear it. And he also ordered the person who, you know, the, the, the dead person to be uh, shrouded with the white, you know, with the white uh, garment. And then Umar ibn al-Khattab continued and he said, وَلَا يُرَى عَلَيْهِ أَثَرُ السَّفَرِ That there were no signs of a journey to be seen upon him. What does this mean? This means that he wasn't known in the city. He wasn't known in, uh, in uh, you know, the city, in, in al Madina, And he came with this characteristic of having you know, this beautiful characteristic, you know, you know, deep black hair um, and uh, the, um, 
uh, and the uh, and there were no signs and there was no dust upon him he wasn't disheveled or anything like this and uh, the, the Sheikh says that when we see a person who's been on a journey, we see that, you know, that this is characteristic, you might have some dust upon him, and he's a bit disheveled and so on and so forth, but none of that was seen upon him. And likewise, he had an intensely white thobe. You know, it's as if, the Sheikh says, as if he just left his house, he just, you know, uh, cleansed himself and wore the new clothes and, you know, whatever, and he just literally left his house at that moment in time, right? And that's how we basically saw him. As if he just left his house after having, you know, uh, come out in this dressed in this manner, and you know, and the sheikh says, how, you know, how can this be? How, 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 how can this be? Uh, the sheikh says that when, 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 when Umar ibn al-Khattab said that there were no signs of journey upon him, this indicates that, you know, it was something they considered to be something strange that a man should come in this in this form in in this manner, and. You know, he, he's not someone who's been on a journey, and none of, none of them even knew him, as occurs. Wala ya'rifuhu minna ahad, that none of us even knew him. And, um, you know, so it, it, this was something that, they, that was, was, was uh, strange that this, this should occur. And there are some other narrations, uh, some other narrations um, that Jibreel, alayhi salatu wasalam, uh, that perhaps sometimes he came in the form of a, of a companion called uh, Dahiyatul Kalbi, one of the Sahaba. And so he would come in the form of this companion, then he would come and ask the Prophet Sallallahu and then the Prophet Sallallahu would respond. But uh, uh, the, 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 the Shaykh says that this is not what is intended here. Like when Umar ibn al-Khattab said that no signs of a journey were upon him and you know, no one, none of us knew him, because clearly Umar, Umar said that none of us knew him. None of us knew him. So obviously, in this situation, this can't be the case. In this situation, he didn't come in the form of uh, the, 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 the companion, uh, the Hitul Kalbi, because, because of what Umar ibn al-Khattab said, even though this uh, occurs in some of the other uh, narrations. So, anyway, um, this then, what's happening here is that this man has come in the presence of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, and he came in order for education at Ta'aleem. Because Jibreel he came in he came as two you know he came as two uh, you know he came as two things. Number one, he came as a muta'allim, right? So he came as someone who is going to learn, and he he also came as a mu'allim, as someone who is going to teach. He's muta'allim. He is a student in the sense that in the form that he's appeared, in the way that he's appeared, and in the manner that he's going to obviously sit and ask the Prophet وسلم, and the adab and the mannerism that he's going to show, then in that sense he's come in the form of a muta'allim, someone who is a student and someone who's coming to, to learn. And he is a muallim in the sense that he's asking questions in order that the Sahaba may benefit from the answers and so that the ummah as a whole may benefit you know after the sahaba the ummah as a whole may benefit after after the sahaba so then umar ibn al-khattab says that he put his knees next to his knees and he placed the pa- his palms upon his thighs so now there's a question here regarding like because we've got some pro you know we have some uh, Pronouns here, uh, you know, he, 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 he put his knees next to his knees and he placed his palms next to his, or upon his thighs. Now the question here is that these pronouns, his knees next to his knees and his palm upon his thighs, who are they referring to? What, what's the order? Is it referring to the Messenger of Islam, his knees and then Jibreel's knees? Or is it, Jibreel, uh, this man who we know to be Jibreel at the end of the hadith, is it Jibreel's knees and then the Prophet's knees, and then is it Jibreel's palms upon the palms of the Prophet, or is it upon his own? You know, so there's a question here now that this, these pronouns that, that, uh, that, that are mentioned in, the, in this part, uh, uh, what are they referring to? And so the Shaykh explains, he says, first of all, that the first pronoun goes back to Jibreel, meaning that he placed his knees 
So here this is now Jibreel. He placed his knees towards his knees, meaning now the, the Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And this signifies that, that you know, this, this person who's come, this man who's come as a student, that he is placing himself near to the, to the alim, to the teacher. Right? He's placed himself near, he's placed himself right close to the one who's going to be asked, so that basically this is the most befitting and the best way in presenting the question. This is the best way and the, the, the best manner in which, to, in which to present the question. And this is so that basically uh, the, the, there won't be any kind of, um, again, like any, there won't be any other voices that might interrupt, or nor will there be any need to raise the voice in this kind of situation. So it's basically, it's, it's, a, it's, it's a mannerism which is, uh, it's like the best mannerism in which to put a question, and likewise in also, in also, in also to, to, to receive uh, the answer. A person will be better understand the answer in, the, in this manner. And then he placed his palms upon his thighs. Now again, similar question. These, these pronouns, what, what, who, what are they referring to? Um, and the answer is, well, in one, in one view, the answer is that he placed, that Jibreel is referring to Jibreel's palms, placing them upon the thighs of the Prophet ﷺ. So some, some scholars say that this is the case, and they say that the reason for this is because when we look at the first half of the sentence, where it was Jibreel put his knees next to the knees of the Messenger ﷺ, then the second half of the sentence follows on in that same order and so therefore it would mean it would mean that Jibreel uh, put his uh, his um, uh, palms upon the thighs of the Prophet ﷺ, and that this is the case because the the pronouns should be in, in agreement so that there's you know there's no contradiction there's no like opposition and there isn't anything to indicate otherwise either as well right there's nothing otherwise in this uh, wording to indicate that it, that it is other than the order in, uh, that was in the first case, right? Meaning that Jibreel put his knees next to the knees of the Prophet ﷺ, and then he put his uh, palms upon the thighs of the Prophet ﷺ. However, some other scholars say that no, this is not the case, because uh, the second half when it says that he placed his palms upon his thighs, then it is referring to the palms of Jibreel upon the thighs of Jibreel, alayhi salatu wasalam. So it's as if he, you know, he placed his, uh, you know, he, put, he, he sat with the messenger, sallallahu alayhi wasallam, put his knees into his knees, and then placed his own uh, palms upon his own thighs. And uh, they say that this is, this is the adab, uh, this, is the, 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 this, is, this is the type of uh, respect and mannerism that he's showing in front of the, you know, in front of the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam, right? So basically, this is a type of humility and, uh, you know, like adab, uh, mannerism, uh, <coughs> in in front of, you know, the, the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam, who has like a certain station and uh, position. So the Shaykh then says that from this we learn that a student of knowledge, it is desirable that he should be compo that he should compose himself in a like manner right that he composes himself uh you know in front of the the one who's being questioned in order that you know the response that he receives as well that the, the, that the whole manner in which he sits uh that it is basically done in in a good way that he places his limbs in in, in a nice way and uh, whilst being close to the person who's being questioned. And all of this is an important type of adab, mannerisms. It's, you know, it's like it's the way that the student of knowledge should ask an alim, a scholar. Or it's the way that a student should, or a muta'allim, should ask a seeker of knowledge. And you know, this itself, the actual way in which the question is asked, and the way that a person composes themselves in, 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 in uh, asking the question, it has an effect. It, it actually does have an uh, effect upon whether the alim will accept his question or not, 
And likewise, to what level the alim will open himself up in the answer that he gives. Right? So now pay, pay, pay careful attention to this. The Sheikh says that in, uh, in the... Uh, the, in, in, in the topic of the adab, the mannerisms of the seeking of knowledge, and likewise in the speech that we find regarding this topic, it is mentioned, so when we look at this topic and we go back to the narrations and so on and so forth, and we learn about how should a student of knowledge compose himself and the adab that, they, that, 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 that he ought to have, that we find that it's mentioned that some of the scholars from the scholars of the Salaf, when certain students would come to them, they would be very eager to give them whatever they, 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 they would give, meaning in terms of knowledge. And when other students would come, they wouldn't be that eager. right? So they would only give them some part of, of the speech or of the answer, but even then it was like general. right? So look at this. So an alim, with some he would give openly and, and freely from his knowledge, and with others, he would just give, you know, a, a part of it, and even then, just keep it general. Or it wouldn't. Or he, or he would give give him something, but it wouldn't be complete from every single angle. So he'd give him an answer, but he wouldn't give him a, give him a complete answer or the complete knowledge from every single angle. Why is this? You know, why why would an alim <coughs> treat some students different to other students? The answer is what we all go back to. It goes back to, the Sheikh says, the adab of the talib al the mannerism of the student of knowledge, or the, you know, the, 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 the student, the secret of knowledge, or, or the student. And so the Sheikh explains and he says that every time the muta'allim, the, the student, has a greater degree of adab, right, manner, his manners are more excellent, and he's more excellent in his manners in terms of his wording, and in his in his questioning, or you know, then this will have a more profound effect upon the one being questioned, the one who's being asked the question. Then it will have a more profound effect effect upon him, and so therefore, he will then be very eager, and he will prepare himself in order to give the answer, the proper answer, because as as the Sheikh says, لِأَنَّهُ مَنْ اِحْتَرَمَ وَحْتُرِمَ that the one who shows respect. He receives respect. The one who gives respect, then he will receive respect. And the one who like turns wholeheartedly towards someone, then likewise he will wholeheartedly be turned to. This is how this is this is how it is. And so this shows that we should all you know we, we should uh, all have this type of uh, mannerism. And then the Sheikh says, he gives an example. He says, for example, I notice that some of the students of knowledge. Or some of the, the, the some of the seekers of knowledge and some of the, the students that when they come and ask an alim, you know they come and ask him and they, they you know they they, they, they they maybe they come and ask him and it's like calling out or whatever and they, they're not really asking him uh, such that he they, they will benefit and likewise they will sit in a jalsa they will sit in the you know gathering of the alim himself or uh, they will might sit you know. Um, they, 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 they will sit and you know, one ha the hands are, uh, 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 one hand is one place and another hand is another place and you know one is here and there and it's not like in a, in, a, in a good mannerism and his body likewise his body is in such like it's as if he's like relaxing he's like perfectly he's as if he's some you know taking a, uh, some relaxation or something no, he's not someone who's like composed and gathered together I mean he's gathered he's composed he's gathered together for the knowledge. You know, all of this shows that this, you know, he's he's gayr muta'adib. He's, he's he's not showing the right mannerisms with with the alim, or you know, with 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 you know the the the, the or with the, the the student of knowledge from him from whom he's trying to to benefit from. And so the sheikh says that this this adab, these mannerisms, and this behavior, it actually does have an effect upon the alim, upon you know the the, the alim, or upon the one who is responding. Any per other the person who's responding to the question, because if you want to take knowledge from this person, then every time you show you show more humility, right? In in the Sharia manner, in, in, in according to the Sharia, in taking knowledge, 
then the more you do that, then the more the alim will, you know, be will will will, will turn to you and will obviously give you what you know what, what you were asking for. And that's why the Sheikh says that you find that many of the, the, the people of knowledge they have like a, they have like a specific you know close group of students of knowledge that like with them they always have like these this close group uh, of people who are their close students of knowledge and what does this go back to how come how come these people are able to be with with this alim and be with the sheikh and the sheikh likewise likes their company and they be with him and they benefit how how you know what 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 does this go back to this obviously goes back to the other the mannerisms um you know it goes back to that this 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 student of the secret of knowledge that he has excellent mannerisms in his wording in his dealing in his speech in the way he moves in the way he uh, uh, w- with his sheikh and you know in, in in his interaction and this is what she, this is what makes the sheikh place trust in him and you know he he turns to him with knowledge and he gives him uh, knowledge which he wouldn't give to anybody else you know he gives him from his own experience in life and likewise from his own experience with knowledge and with other scholars and other affairs he gives to this student of knowledge which he wouldn't give to anybody else right and uh, and in reality these are affairs which a person wouldn't benefit from wouldn't benefit from unless he was someone who showed you know the same kind of other but mannerisms to 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 the alim so from this then so one of the so this is like a an important point that we take from this hadith the first thing that we take from this hadith is uh this this affair here from the hadith of jibril that um the issue of adab in seeking knowledge and the issue of adab with the people of knowledge and he says the sheikh says that we say we can take the same thing from the story of al khidr with uh, Musa alayhi salam in Surah Al-Kahf in the 18th Surah where we read about the story of Musa and Khidr and again how Khidr was the teacher and Musa alayhi salam was the one who's learning you know the, the, the student and again in there as well there are, there are the same there are the same lessons to be mentioned about the issue of knowledge and the seeking of knowledge and how a, a seeker of knowledge should be with the uh, teacher so then after this, so after understanding the, you know, something that's worthy of reflecting upon the issue of uh, the other, the, 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 the mannerisms of the secret knowledge, we then move on to the next uh, part in the hadith, and this is when this man, who we know to be Jibreel, he says, Ya Muhammad, akhbirni anil Islam. O Muhammad, inform me about Islam. So he said, akhbirni anil Islam. So this question is regarding one of the levels of the religion or one of the forms of the religion because as we said before that the deen as a whole is made up of levels and so this question is regarding one of those which is islam but this islam that is being asked about is the islam that pertains to the outward actions right the outward actions so he asked asked about islam first of all which here is the outward actions now what is it that we see from a person outwardly and apparently that represents Islam and then obviously later on he will ask him, ask him about Iman and then he will ask him about Al-Ihsan so first of all though he said uh, uh, O Muhammad inform me akhbirni an al-Islam and from this word first of all when he said akhbirni akhbirni means inform me convey to me the news convey to me the information about uh, Islam and this proves that the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam is Mukhbir. Mukhbir, meaning that he is an informer. He is someone who himself he informs, meaning he narrates from some you know, he's narrating something, he's informing about something, meaning that this knowledge doesn't come from him, he's merely an informer, he is a mukhbir. And likewise, this 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 wording here, Akhbirni an al-Islam, is in agreement with what is known in the Sharia regarding the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam that he is a muballih, that he is someone who came to convey the religion from Allah, the mighty and majestic. So, so meaning that the wording used here, akhbirni an al-Islam, indicates that the Prophet Islam is a mukhbir, one who uh, just merely conveys the knowledge about the religion. 
And so, so the Sheikh says, Qala akhbirni, meaning make your speech for me to be a khabar, meaning to be like some news or information. So uh, inform me of that. So the Prophet, sallallahu alaihi wasallam, as we've said, he himself was a mukhbir from his Lord. He is someone who informed from his Lord. And this is why we find, in fact, in many other ahadith, if you look in many of the ahadith Qudsi, that when we read these ahadith Qudsi, and we see that the narrator who is narrating, or the, the compiler who is compiling the, the hadith, they often say, Qala fima yukhbiru, uh, fima, uh, fima yukhbiru bihi an rabbihi. They often use this phrase, which means that he, meaning the Prophet, وسلم, from that which he informs about his Lord is that he said, is that he said such and such. Right? So, used to, so this shows that the Prophet وسلم, is a mukhbir and that he narrates from his Lord. So what did he say in response to this question? He said, Aqala uh, al-Islam, al-Islam an tashhadu an la ilaha illallah wa anna muhammadan rasulullah that you testify that there is none which has the right to be worshipped except Allah and that Muhammad is the messenger of Allah to the end of the to the end of the uh, hadith uh, to the end of the, this particular sentence and this is a general explanation of Islam which is the five pillars of Islam and as we shall see that in the next hadith which is the hadith of Ibn Umar the next hadith of Ibn Umar is actually bunyal Islam al al khams Islam is built upon five, and that will be treated in more detail in the next hadith. But here, it's uh, basically an explanation of Islam, that Islam is, is, is five pillars. And then he mentions them, first of all, that he testified that there is none that has the right to be worshipped except Allah alone, and that Muhammad is the messenger of Allah. This is the first pillar, and then the other pillars, that you establish the prayer, that you give the zakah, that you fast in Ramadan, and that you, fa- that you pil- make a pilgrimage to the house if you are able to find a way. And then the man said, Sadaqt, that you have spoken the truth. So here then, when we look at the affairs that have been mentioned as making up Islam, then the Prophet ﷺ explained Islam to be the outward actions, the outward apparent actions. And he didn't make any of the inward actions. He didn't mention any of the inward actions. He mentioned all actions which are outward. Right? You testify that none has a right to be worshipped with your speech. Right? You practice you, you perform the five prayers, outward actions. You give the charity, outward action. You fast in Ramadan, outward action. You make pilgrimage, outward action. So this shows, what does it show? That Islam, what is the essence of Islam? Islam is to show outward submission. Islam is to show outward submission. So this Islam that we are talking of, remember, this is, this is Islam. <coughs> this is Islam, which is one level of a number of levels which collectively make up the whole of Islam. Remember what we said at the beginning that there is Islam as a whole, then within it there is Islam, Iman and Ihsan. So this specific Islam that we are speaking of here is the Islam which represents outward submission. Outward sub- submission by way of these outward actions. And how can a person, how does a person express and show this outward submission the way he does it is that he informs with the shahadatain, meaning that he makes this outward testification. He says, "Ashhadu an la ilaha illallah wa ashhadu anna Muhammadan abduhu wa rasuluhu." Testify that none has a right to be worshipped except Allah, and that Muhammad is the messenger of Allah, sallallahu alaihi wasallam. So, so he does this, and then at the same time, he establishes the four uh, pillars of action. And so we find, so what do we find? We find that if we put all of these five together, we find that they are all outward, right? They're all outward. The, 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 the four pillars are outward. But the first one, the testification, that when we look at it, we find that basically that this first one, uh, a shahada, that this word shahida, it has an element to it which is belief, i'tiqad. But so the other four are outward, the prayer is outward, fasting is outward, giving charity is outward, is apparent, and likewise doing hajj is outward and apparent. But the first one, this shahada, when we look at this word, the shahada, we find 
that this shahada actually has two parts to it. It's both outward and it's inward. And this is because the nature of giving testimony or making a testification is such that you first of all must believe in the correctness of what you are testifying about or what you are testifying with. Right? So the nature of the shahada the, 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 is such that it implies both things. It implies something that's inward and something that's outward. And so therefore the Sheikh says that this word that this word shahada, when we look at we look at it, what does it imply? It implies a number of things. First of all, it implies i'tiqad. It implies belief that a person must obviously believe the thing which he's expressing and testifying. Secondly, it implies at tahaduth meaning informing and speaking about it. And thirdly, it implies al ikhbar which is informing, meaning notifying other people about it. So when we look at this word shahada, then these are the meanings that it comprises. It has an inward element, and likewise it has an outward element. The inward element is that it must, that it obviously, there's, there's a certain amount of belief in there, and the outward element is that a person speaks with it, and he informs other people about it. And now, when we understand that these are the three, two or three meanings, these are two or three meanings that the shahada, word shahada can carry, then this likewise helps us to understand the verse in the Qur'an, in which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, شَهِدَ اللَّهُ أَنَّهُ لَا إِلَهَ إِلَّا هُوَ وَالْمَلَائِكَةُ وَأُولِي الْعِلْمِ قَائِمًا بِالْقِسْتِ لَا إِلَهَ إِلَّا هُوَ لَا إِلَهَ إِلَّا هُوَ الْأَزِيزُ الْحَكِيمُ Allah indeed witnesses that there is none that is worthy of worship except He and the angels likewise you know, witness and the people of knowledge likewise witness all established in justice there is none which has a right to be worshipped except He, Al-Aziz, the Mighty, Al-Hakim, the All-Wise. What does it mean when it says, Shahid Allahu? Shahid Allahu. What does it mean? The meaning here is, it means uh, that He informs. That He knows and He informs. Allah informs. So, the, 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 the meaning, what we're trying to get, what the Shaykh is getting across here is that when a Muslim testifies, meaning that he believes in his heart, there is none which has the right to be worshipped, then his testification can never ever be correct whilst he conceals and hides this testification. Right? You know, anyone who basically testifies in his heart, but then he doesn't make it apparent outwardly, and he doesn't have any legitimate excuse in the Sharia to not, not to do so, then his shahada is not acceptable. There is no shahada. He doesn't have any shahada. Right, so he testifies in his heart, but he doesn't do it outwardly, and there's nothing, with, there's no excuse for him not to do that. Then he does not have any shahada at all, because in the shahada it is a must, from you know, from 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 even from even when we look at the word linguistically speaking, the Sheikh says, even from a linguistic point of view, the word shahada or testimony means something that you believe inside to be the truth, and then you testify to it, or you testify for it, right, outwardly, even linguistically. If a person was to believe in something and testify to something in the heart, but not outwardly express it, then this would not be considered a valid testimony. It wouldn't be accepted and it wouldn't be correct. So even from a linguistic point of view, and obviously from a Sharia point of view, we know that you know, there must be idhar. There must be, you know, when we look at the Sharia evidence, there must be an outward uh, manifestation of the uh, testification, the testimony uh, that a Muslim uh, makes. So... So we see from that then that four pillars are actions, outward actions, and the first pillar is both, it's inward and it's outward. And so therefore, <coughs> um, uh, the, 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 yeah, so what we mean by the shahada is that after having the belief, there must be idhar, must be manifestation, al-i'lam and al-ikhbar, meaning notifying and informing other people. However, we find that there is a small element here which is belief, al-i'tiqad. There is a small amount here. And so what we find that in reality, there must be that this inward element of belief, al-i'tiqad, is, is, so what the shaykh says, what we say is that this Islam, which we know to be outward, it's an outward manifestation, 
But nevertheless, there is still something from this Islam that we are speaking of, which is inward, that there must be this small inward element which makes everything else correct. Right? And that small inward element is that belief, that i'tiqad in a person's heart about the correctness of this testification that he believes in. When that inward belief is present, then it makes this other outward Islam to be correct as well, to be correct likewise. So therefore what we're saying here, what the Shaykh is saying, that this inward, that small amount of inward belief, there must be this small inward belief that validates everything else from what, what, what is Islam, meaning what is which, which is basically the five pillars. So what is this small inward amount of belief? What, what is it? What, what, what is this small thing that must be there? And the answer is, it is what we call the obligatory iman in the six pillars. Right? So a person, so a person, Islam <coughs> cannot be correct. This Islam cannot be correct unless there is an element of iman in his heart. Which is, the, which, which is the element, which, which is the iman, which is the belief in these six pillars. That a person just generally has a general belief in Allah and his angels and his books and his messengers and, you know, Al-Qadr and so on and so, on and so forth on the last day, right? So, so, so when we speak of Islam, strictly speaking, it's not just outward, it's not all outward. There must be a small element in there which is inward, right, which then validates and makes that outward Islam to be correct and acceptable. And, and, and the lowest level of that Iman that must be present is just the general belief in uh, the six pillars. So therefore, <coughs> what we call Al-Iman Al-Wajib, right, the, the, the Iman that is Wajib that any Muslim should have, every Muslim should have, is this, you know, is, 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 is the, the six pillars of Iman. And this is included... In the statement when we say that you testify that, no, that none has a right to be worshipped except Allah. Because to testify that none has a right to be worshipped except Allah, this implies belief. As we've said before, it implies belief and then to speak with it and to inform and to notify. And it includes all of these things. And so therefore in reality we find that because it includes this small amount of belief, then it also refer, falls back and goes back to the six pillars of Iman. So the, the point of this discussion here now is that uh, the, 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 even though the people of knowledge have said that Islam, what is meant by Islam is the outward actions. That when we see a person for doing the outward actions, he testifies, none has the right to be worshipped except Allah, he prays, he fasts, he does hajj, whatever, then we see outward Islam from him. However, <coughs> this Islam that we're seeing from this person wouldn't be correct and valid unless there is a certain degree or amount of iman which validates that, that outward iman, the outward Islam, sorry. And this, this, this iman or this portion or this amount of iman, then the proof for it is, the proof that this, that this iman must exist, which validates the outward Islam, the proof for it in this hadith is the use of the word shahida, and tashhada, that you testify, right? Because as we said, the word shahida, it implies with it, within it belief, as well as outward you know, expression of the testimony. And because of that, this is a proof, therefore, that this Islam, which is outward, must have a certain level or degree of inward Iman that validates that outward uh, Iman. So, uh, the Shaykh says, so therefore, the belief, the i'tiqad, that small element of belief, is, uh, you know, testifying that none has a right to be worshipped except Allah, which itself implies belief in Allah, Iman in Allah, and likewise, belief that the Prophet Muhammad is the messenger of Allah and obviously uh, th th this then also implies that we believe in the Prophet and whatever he came with, whatever he informed with and obviously he informed us about the angels, the books, the messengers, the last day and Al-Qadr, the good and its evil. Right, so the point that we're trying to, the point to understand is look at how the Shaykh is explaining how we are deriving the proof, how we are deducing the proof from the Hadith that first of all, Islam is something that's outward, because all of these actions are outward. But at the same time, Islam must also, there must be something inward of belief, right, that validates the outward Islam, that makes it correct. Meaning, as opposed to a hypocrite, right? Hypocrite, outwardly he testifies, he does the five, you know, he does the pillars, 
But does he really have that inward iman, that true inward belief, that, that the element of belief in Allah and the books and the message, whatever? He doesn't. So therefore, his Islam is not valid. But only, only Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows that. So what we're speaking of here is that correct Islam must have a small amount of belief, element of belief, which, com which comes back down. Which, and the way, that, the way that we know that is, uh, that, and that belief, the proof for it is, that first of all, he must believe in Allah and his messenger. And believing in Allah and his messenger also implies that he believes in everything that they're informed of. And what they're informed of are angels, books, messengers, the last day, Al-Qadr. So this proves therefore that that small element of belief that a person must have alongside the outward Islam is a general belief in the six pillars of Iman. And if a person has that inwardly, and outwardly he has the outward Islam, then his Islam is valid and is correct. And the proof for all of this explanation is the fact that the word Shahida was used in the Hadith. Right? Because the word Shahida means an inward belief, which then is expressed outwardly in the form of informing and you know, uh, uh, informing uh, others. So with that, inshallah, we'll stop the lesson today. And we'll continue with the next part, which is Iman. Uh, and we'll continue with that in the next lesson, inshallah ta'ala. We'll stop there for today and continue uh, from this point onwards.